Good evening, everyone. My name is Judy Gassner, and I'm with the Torrance Memorial Health Foundation. And this evening, we have a special guest, Dr. Christopher Suhar, that will give a lecture on cardiology and integrative medicine. I'd like to give you, uh, tell you a little bit about Dr. Suhar. Uh, he's a cardiologist with expertise in general cardiology and integrative medicine. He also has subspecialty training in echocardiology and nuclear cardiology. In addition to utilizing conventional medicine, Dr. Suhar uses evidence-based alternative therapies alternative therapies to treat patients with coronary artery disease, irregular heartbeat, high cholesterol, and hypertension. He also believes in prevention, working with patients to identify potential risk factors, including family history, to prevent cardiovascular disease. In addition to his clinical practice, he conducts research on the outcomes and long-term benefits of integrative medicine and lifestyle changes in people with cardiovascular disease. He is also involved in researching the benefits of new technologies for patients in cardiac rehabilitation. Dr. Suhar currently sees patients at the Scripps Center for Integrative Medicine. He believes emotional and spiritual health is, are as important as physical health and that a person is more than their physical illness. He believes that lifestyle changes such as diet, exercise, and stress reduction can only improve heart health, but also reverse heart disease. And when he's not caring for his patients, he enjoys spending time with his family and for children and participating sports. He's an Eagle Scout and enjoys hiking and camping. Currently, Dr. Suhar is medical director of the Scripps Center for Integrative Medicine. After the lecture, there will be a Q&A session. You can write your questions in the chat box. The chat box can be found on your control panel. Please direct your questions to Torrance Memorial. We will answer as many questions as we can, allowing for time. Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Judy, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, for those of you that have your video on, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Let me see some thumbs. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, my name is Chris Suhar, and I am the medical director of the Scripps Center for Integrative Medicine, as Judy uh, mentioned. Uh, I want to first start by, uh, and I'm, I'm also a cardiologist, integrative trained uh, general cardiologist. I do active practice in both outpatient, but I also do inpatient medicine. I want to thank uh, Torrance Memorial for uh, this generous offer to come and share my passion with uh, everybody that's on the call tonight. And uh, Judy Gassner, I've been working with her and she's been a, 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 a just a, a peach as far as uh, a person to work with and really understands and gets uh, kind of what we're trying to accomplish with integrative medicine. So a couple ground rules with Zoom. So first of all, if you have a camera and you can turn it on, I love to see your faces. Um, I understand not everybody has cameras or some people just don't want to be seen. But I feel in this time where we're not able to connect, this is the best we've got where we can at least see each other's smiles on uh, Zoom. So, uh, so thank you for those that are turning it on and those that already have it on. Uh, this is um, somewhat impersonal because it's on Zoom. Uh, it's again, the best we have. Um, if I have the, um, the privilege of being invited back, I would love the opportunity to come and speak to everybody in person. I have a, such a better way to connect in person. I like to walk around and engage the audience. Um, from that perspective, my talk, I've got some questions built in where I generally ask the audience. Since I can't get the feedback for my questions, if I ask you a question, I'll pause for a few seconds and then I will um, just go ahead and give you the answer. Normally I engage and try to get answers out of the audience and it's a little more interactive, but we can't do that today. Uh, and then lastly, I am not going to be monitoring the chat during the talk part of this. We'll do that during the Q&A. And the reason for that is it's just hard to kind of be in my mojo with the talk and then not be able to uh, 
and then to be able to read the chat at the same time, it's just too difficult. So I've learned that we just ignore the chat. So don't worry about putting things in there. If you have questions you think of, you can put in there and we'll get to it eventually when we get to the Q&A section. I did set my alarm. I tend to go over, um, but I set it to make sure we have time for Q&A. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen. Again, let me see some thumbs up if you can see my screen. Can you guys see my slides there? It should say a healthy heart at any age. Okay, great. Um, so um, in most medical presentations, we start off with a slide discussing our disclosures. I don't make money off of anything I am coming to you guys with today. I don't sell supplements. I don't sell certain procedures. I am a cardiologist and I'm very passionate about what I do. So I have nothing to do, disclose. I have no other organizations I work with other than Scripps Health System that I am hired and, and work as a physician. Okay, so I thought I would begin with an exercise, a breathing exercise. So what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is in just a moment, we are going to take a large collective breath together. We are gonna breathe in for four seconds, we are gonna hold for seven and breathe out for eight. And I am going to do the counting. Um, I would like you guys to put down whatever you're holding or whatever you have, and you're gonna close your eyes and I'll instruct you what to do. So everybody get comfortable. And for those with your video, I can see you. So I can see you guys what you're doing, all right? So I'm watching. Okay, so let's all take a breath in. One, two, three, four. Hold it, two, three, four, five, six, seven and breathe out two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, open your eyes, please. So I actually love this exercise. This is a therapy that I actually give to my patients, believe it or not, and is something that uh, is very useful. And we are gonna talk about this eventually later on in this talk. But I do wanna point out, this exercise takes a total of 19 seconds. You can do it anywhere. It is absolutely portable. You just have to keep your eyes open when you drive. There are no side effects. There is no interactions with your medications. And most importantly, it's free. I am not selling you on something. And again, there is a lot of power in something as simple as taking a deep breath holding it and breathing it out with purpose. But the real question that a lot of patients ask at this point is what the heck is a cardiologist doing recommending a breathing exercise for his patients? Um, and, and so I wanna take a quick moment and just explain my background. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you're gonna see that I'm pretty darn passionate about this. Um, I actually, my undergraduate was in mechanical engineering. It was very science-based, very science-oriented. Um, I still had this passion for wanting to take care of patients, so I went to medical school. Um, it was my father who's the one that really got me into medicine because he was sick my entire life. Um, he was diagnosed with terminal end-stage lung cancer at age 31. He was given six months to live. I was just a new, I was, uh, I think, uh, one years old when he was diagnosed. And um, 10 years later, he was deemed cancer free. It was truly a miracle. And everything that I know in medicine, he actually should not have survived that. There was many things that went right in his care. Um, he went through chemotherapy, seven major surgeries, and he went through a lot of hell, but he also had a lot of love, support, a lot of friendships, a lot of very good physicians and a lot of very caring people. Then my father um, at age 52 developed adult onset type two diabetes and died at age 61 from complications of diabetes. I was, le I was in medicine at that point. I was a brand new physician. I just gotten graduated medical school, really didn't know what I was doing. And at that point, my dad died. And I was left empty, very lost, because my dad beat a disease that he really should have died from and died from a disease that I think is beatable or at least manageable. 
and yet he succumbed to it. And I was left very empty in that, and I was left looking for new approaches to medicine. My dad was taking 19 different pills at the end of his life. He was taking insulin in addition to that. And so I was looking for a new approach and then I found actually the Scripps Center for Integrative Medicine where I met my mentors and ended up uh, really setting up my career. So let's talk about integrative medicine. First thing I like to point out is that there is a lot of traditional therapy in medicine, a lot of conventional therapy that I think kicks butt. I think it is awesome. We are really good at surgical care, acute care. When you need a care now, get to an ER, call 911, you get taken care of. We're, we have great antibiotics that have made a huge outcome, a huge difference in infections. We have some of the best diagnostics out there, okay? I get a lot of patients that come to me questioning conventional medicine, and I like to stress that conventional medicine works. This is the arm of my daughter when she was three years old, when she fell off of a playground set and her arm was broken. There was no supplement that was going to fix this arm. The, the, only, reason, the only reason the breathing technique worked is it helped calm myself and my wife down. Um, there was no alternative approach that, that my daughter needed at that moment. What she needed was she needed to be fixed and casted and have her arm reset by an orthopedist. And that's what she got. And her arm is beautiful to this day. There is lots of strength in conventional medicine. I do not poo-poo that. I embrace that and use that all the time in the world of integrative medicine. However, with all the great care that we've got in our world, in, in the world of healthcare, we are losing the battle. Lives taken from cardiovascular disease continue to rise. It's a global problem where 18, over 18 million deaths are attributed to cardiovascular disease. The cost of cardiovascular disease alone is over $360 billion. We are losing the batter, battle to heart disease and you could put in any chronic disease in place of this slide, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, the numbers continue to rise despite the best of Western conventional medicine. We also spend, this, this is kind of a complicated slide, but the purple, the purple line represents how much money is spent. The US spends way more than any other country in the world by far, yet our life expectancy is only 27, we rank 27th in the world for longevity compared to other countries. And we become very dependent on pharmaceutical medications, on drugs. So why are patients uh, seeking out, well, first of all, patients decided to take matters into their own hands. They're seeking out different approaches, complementary and alternative medicine approaches. We know the use of, of alternative medicine has continued to climb over the years. Billions and billions of dollars are getting spent on this. And the industry of vitamins and supplements have co continued to explode and the numbers have continued to rise. The problem is traditional physicians are sticking their heads in the sand. They're telling their patients, no, do not go use supplements. There's no research, there's no evidence. So you know what most patients are doing? They're saying, thanks doc. They leave, then they go to Trader Joe's or they go to GNC or they go to Ralph's and they talk to some 16 year old punk that's working there for what supplement they should be taking for their health. That's where the advice is coming from. Is that right? So why, why are patients seeking out this care? Patients are dissatisfied with conventional, conventional treatments. They're getting side effects. They're getting irradiated. They don't, they don't want to do all these traditional therapies. They want more autonomy and control over their decisions. My father was of the generation where he would go to the doctor and he would say, doctor, tell me what to do. That generation is definitely lessening over time. 
Now I get my patients, the majority of my patients come in usually with a ream of documents printed from Google, Dr. Google, with information challenging a lot of this stuff. They want to participate. They've got, patients have their own thoughts about this. Many people on this call probably agree with that. They believe that alternative approaches are more compatible with their values and beliefs. That diseases are somehow linked to the environment, to our emotions, to things called mind-body factors, which we're gonna talk about. And a real big reason I get patients that come to me to, for integrative approaches is there's a desire to take less drugs and decrease side effects. So this is a definition that I think is kind of a little kumbaya, but it does, it does nicely kind of summarize integrative medicine. It's integrative medicine is the practice of medicine that reaffirms the importance of the relationship between the practitioner and the patient, focuses on the whole person, is informed by evidence, meaning research, and makes use of all appropriate therapeutic approaches, healthcare professionals, and disciplines to achieve optimal health and healing. Sounds a little too good to be true, but that is really the underlying premise of what we're trying to accomplish in integrative medicine. We're trying to open our toolbox. We're trying to embrace other therapies and say, what, how best can we care for our patient? Why do we have to pigeon ourselves into one area of medicine? Why can't we open that up and do anything we can possible to get our patients better? Unfortunately, the way integrative medicine throughout the years have been looked at like this, this guy and, and this doctor, here the doctor's asking Mr. Wordle, have you been messing around with alternative medicine? You know, this has changed. I started my, my, my training in the early 2000s and I was teased by a lot of my colleagues. I was called, you know, herbal head or grass head, you know. Everybody thought I was pushing weed and I actually have never tried pot myself. I've never prescribed marijuana myself, although I do think there is some value in that. Um, in edibles, but but that's a, a whole nother discussion. But but what's funny is a lot of my a lot of my partners where they used to tease me back in the early two thousands now refer their patients to me. They see the value that we have gotten from integrative medicine. Um, some of the theories here in car in my world of integrative cardiology, we go to advanced cholesterol testing, not just the standard tests. We really focus on early detection and pre prevention. There's a difference between early detection and screening versus prevention. You know, getting mammograms, colonoscopies, those are so important, but those are screening tools. Those are not necessarily prevention. A lot of people get confused about that. Um, nutrition, exercise, big part of what I do. My big passion is lifestyle medicine. I try to practice what I preach I, so I can relate to my patients. I also want to stay healthy. That's really why I do it. Um, I, I do believe in medicines when they're necessary. I do believe herbs and supplements are also a type of medicine that have real effect and real side effects and should be prescribed by people that know what they're doing. Um, and I'm a big, big proponent of mind-body therapies. These are things where we, we learn stress mastery, you know, embrace group support, embrace spirituality that can go a long way to helping us heal and become healthy. In my personal practice, we treat the whole person, not just some silo, uh, care with passion, listen, try to listen to my patients. The answers are usually there. It, you know, I, I hear time and time, you know, I went to the doctor, they didn't even look at me. I didn't, they didn't, they didn't listen to me, you know? And we try to, you know, slow down, take a little more time and let the patients really voice their concerns. Expect participation. That's one of my biggest frustrations. A patient will come and say, I don't want to take these drugs. And I'm like, okay, you got to eat better. You got to exercise more. You got to learn how to meditate. We come up with this great plan. They leave, then they come back and they haven't done a thing. Yet they don't want to take drugs. You know, it's like, you got you to gotta meet me somewhere here. So I do expect participation. Education goes a long way. If my patients really understand what I'm trying to accomplish for their health, 
you know, then, then they usually participate and even sometimes understand why I would recommend a prescription medication over a supplement. And then use the best of all, all worlds. One of the things I said at the beginning of my visit is that I am not an alternative medicine doctor. I am an integrative medicine doctor and I'm going to recommend what I think is the best approach. Sometimes that's alternative medicine, sometimes that's conventional medicine. But anyways, that is kind of the general approach. And I would argue most people that practice integrative approaches take these kind of approaches. I am involved nationally in a number of different consortiums in integrative medicine. There's been this big push nationally to get education in medical schools changed because it, the traditional way has not been accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish for outcomes in health for the general population. So we need to start at, you know, most physicians have never had even one lecture on nutrition or on exercise. You know, could we start incorporating that more in our medical schools? Could we start opening up the pharmacy toolbox and incorporating some supplements, you know, into that? So anyway, so I would argue most integrated practices go with this route. Okay, so we're gonna go through these slides a little quickly. Usually this is where I, I just wanna kinda of give you guys my thoughts on some of the big risk factors that we worry about with cardiac patients. Like if you come to a cardiologist, this is what they worry about. And I'll give you kind of the high level goals and you know, some integrative approaches to them. But uh, I just thought we'd do that since I'm a cardiologist, I gave you kind of my thoughts on that. And then we'll get in more into the meat of some of the lifestyle things that I like to approach my patients with. This is where I usually do my participation. So if I ask a question, I'll wait a few seconds and then we'll go from there. So there are five classic traditional risk factors for a cardiac disease. And I normally would ask you guys, so I'm gonna give these to you. So um, one is smoking. Two is diabetes, three is high cholesterol, four is high blood pressure, and five is family history. These five, if you go to any cardiologist across the country, they will quote these five. Um, and they're all five very important risk factors. And when I have a person at risk for coronary disease, these are the things that I'm typically trying to improve. Um, there are a couple more on my next slide that I'm going to go over that are very, very critical, but they're not taught to cardiologists typically, believe it or not. Um, but before we get to that, my next question I usually ask the audience is which of these five is considered the most important? And again, they're all five critical, but which one would you think of these five is the most important? And I hear from my audiences, all, all five, everybody's like yelling out, all oh, family history, it's genetics, you know, or it's gotta be cholesterol, you know, heart attacks happen because of cholesterol. So believe it or not, they're in order of importance, okay? I would argue smoking by far is the number one risk factor. Diabetes is a very close number two. That shocks a lot of people. People don't realize how big diabetes is for risk factor. Three, four, and five, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and family history are tied for third place, okay? I would say all oh, those three are interchangeable for third place. Again, all five are critical, but if you're to rank those in importance. Now, some of the audience members usually yell out these additional risk factors, which is obesity, stress, anxiety, and depression. These two risk factors are critical risk factors for heart disease, but they're not taught tr as traditional risk factors. But I think these are huge. Okay, so let's go over these risk factors quickly. With obesity, what I like to do is demonstrate this looking at the CDC slide. So this is a slide from 1990 that goes over um, obesity rates in the US. The darker blue states what basically what that represents is that 10 to 14% of the state's population is considered obese by BMI. Now, BMI is not the best marker of, it, of weight, but that's one of the best tools we have, unfortunately. But, but anyway, so 10 to 14% of the darker blue states uh, were considered obese. California was less than 10% back in 1990. 
Flash forward to 2010, this dark red speckled states, um, it always is the southern and southeast areas that have the worst, but more than a third of their state's population is considered obese in 2010. And I can guarantee you, this has gotten worse. I didn't download the 2021 one, but it has gotten worse. Now, we live in California, we live in Southern California, and I'm proud to be in San Diego. I think, I think truly we don't have as much obesity. I went to medical school in Ohio, and I'm telling you, it was a lot worse. Um, one of the best stu uh, research studies you could do on your own is fly and go to different airports. And you can see what I mean, where you can start seeing obesity in different areas of the country. But California, believe it or not, is yellow. And that's in the 20 to almost 25% of our state's population. One out of four or one out of five is considered obese by BMI. You know, again, we're kind of sheltered in Orange County and San Diego. We have a little more, well, I'd probably say a lot more active lifestyles in these areas. You know, that is not true in our entire state. Um, so obesity is a big problem. And what's, what's sad is this has now progressed down to our children. Our children have gotten obese. These two children I'm showing you are not genetically abnormal. They do not have some genetic mutation. They are overweight and they have childhood obesity. I was trained as a pediatric, I was trained in pediatrics. I did two residencies. I did a combined internal medicine pediatric residency. And back in around in the late 90s, when I was doing my pediatric training, um, the American Pediatric Association recognized this. They said, oh my gosh, we have a huge problem. We need to get this better. And so they realized we have a big problem in our schools. And they said, hey, there's some low hanging fruit here. We're, we're, kill, we're, we're causing our kids to get fat because we're selling sodas to our kids in the schools. So they got this big change through the American Pediatric Association, went and they lobbied Congress and they successfully got to pass to eliminate all sodas from our schools. To this day, you cannot go to a public school and purchase a soda from a vending machine. Great idea. This was huge, right? I think most people online would say, that's a really good idea. You're right. A can of soda is like drinking a candy bar. You know, that's going to really help. But it didn't make a difference. It had zero impact in childhood obesity. Why? Well, the reason is that our schools didn't like that idea. And the main reason is the sodas represented revenue or money. That was a big source of pain for equipment in the gym or for music class or whatever. So what did they do? They decided to replace this, the vending machines with juice machines. Now, we're gonna talk about nutrition, but if you look at a label of orange juice and you compare that to a soda, there is actually, if you look at calorie per calorie, there's actually more sugar in 12 ounces of orange juice than there is in a can of Coke. Now, you could challenge me and say, no, doctor, I've looked at the labels, but you got to look at the labels correctly. When you look at a nutrition label, what's the most important fact on a nutrition label? Everybody always says sugar or carbohydrates or sodium. No, the most important fact is serving size, okay? When you look at a nutrition label, the serving size dictates everything on that label. It's all smoke and mirrors. The food industry is evil. They want to fool you, okay? They will do everything to sell their product. So when you look at orange juice, it's in eight ounces. When you look at a soda, it's in 12 ounces when you look at the labels. Eight ounces of orange juice is 100 calories. 12 ounces of soda is 140 calories. So if you add four more ounces, which is 50 calories to the orange juice, that's 150. There's more in orange juice than there is soda. So now 
people follow up, well, doctor, I drink freshly squeezed orange juice. I live in California, I have an orange tree. There, I, so my, my retort is, have you ever squeezed your own oranges? How many oranges does it take to make a glass of orange juice? You're taking the best part of the orange out of the equation, which is the fiber, and you're just drinking the juice. Eat your fruit, never drink it. So I go, I went off on a tangent there, but what I'm saying is sometimes our best laid plans or often our best laid plans get totally jacked up because we're driven by different agendas. These things as patients, you guys need to be savvy and aware of these issues. So what does obesity do? It causes a whole slew of problems that are related to obesity. Heart attacks and coronary disease is just one thing. Strokes, cataracts, pancreatitis, all types of, types of cancer are directly associated with, heart with, with obesity. Arthritis, imagine carrying around an extra 50 pound weight all day long. What's that gonna do to your knees and your back? Well, if you gain 50 pounds, that's what you're doing. You know, women problems, gynecological problems, female problems. Um, number one reason for liver transplant is not alcoholism, it's non-alcoholic fatty liver. Okay, what about smoke, smoking? So what disease do you guys think about in association with smoking? Answer is lung cancer. Everybody thinks of lung cancer. So the follow-up question is what percentage of smokers actually get lung cancer? I think that's a reasonable question. It's actually less than 10%. Now, I'm gonna ask you, what percentage of smokers get cardiovascular disease? You guys probably know where I'm going with this. It's a heck of a lot more patients that get heart disease from smoking than lung cancer. And I think that gets definitely underemphasized and a big problem. I do think in Southern California, we have a heck of a lot smo uh, less smoking. I went to Chicago just before the, everything shut down it was like crazy. I was walking down the street smelling smoke everywhere. And we don't get that as much in California, at least in Southern California. We are blessed, but it still exists. Um, I believe cold turkey is the best approach for quitting. I've been called a punk by one of my patients. He was like, you know, you have never freaking smoked before. You don't understand the power of smoking. And, um, and I, after a week, a week, we had done a lung biopsy a week after he told me how evil it was, how hard, how he couldn't quit smoking all this kind of stuff. A week later, I diagnosed him with um, lung cancer and he quit that day. My father was an avid smoker, avid smoker. He smoked, smoked, smoked. That's why he got lung cancer. I believe that. Um, he bragged to his friends at church that he couldn't quit. He tried to switch to pipes and cigars as a way to quit, which again are worse than cigarettes. He didn't realize that. And he couldn't quit. The day he and my mom were sat down and told that that, that, that mass in his lungs were lung cancer, he quit. So I ask you, what is the number one reason a smoker can't quit smoking? Number one reason. The number one reason a smoker can't quit, I hear, I hear addiction, I hear oral fixation, I hear all these excuses. And those are important reasons, but the number one reason a smoker can't quit is they don't want to. People like smoking. They like the feeling, they enjoy it. It helps anxiety too. So once you really point that out to a patient, it's, it's, it's almost like slaps them in the face. They're like, well, that's a good point. I actually do like smoking. And then they realize what the most, the biggest, where that biggest driver is for the smoking is it's coming from their, from them, not from some chemical of nicotine. Nicotine gum, nicotine patches, electronic cigarettes, which I don't believe in. Wellbutrin, Chantix, these things are used to help people quit. I actually don't think these things are as effective. Um, I do use hypnosis. I think hypnosis is a very effective tool. Unfortunately, not covered usually by insurance, but if you find a good hypnotherapist, they can be very useful. I use hypnosis for addictions all the time. It will not make you quack like a chicken or, or, or give away your bank account. It is a very meditative approach to 
quitting. And I've been hypnotized. I love it. I think it's very effective. Um, diabetes. How does diabetes hurt you? It causes heart attacks, kidney failure, blindness, numbness, infection, and infection. My dad died from a cut on his pinky toe. That was it. An infection got in, he went septic and he died. That was it, a cut on his toe. I'm not gonna take time to go over this slide, but what I can tell you is through research, diabetes and heart attacks have been proven to be equivalent. So if you've been diagnosed with diabetes, you have the same future risk of a heart attack as somebody that's already had a heart attack. So when I have a diabetic patient, I have the same goals of all these risk factors as I would already with somebody that's had a stent, a bypass, or heart attack. So diabetes, you have to understand it's critical that we get their cholesterol better, their blood pressure better, that they're eating better, that they're exercising better. It is critical if you have diabetes. I, I am more passionate about diabetes than I am coronary disease. And, and I, that in part is because of what happened to my father and I miss my father. So, so I, I, I can't stress how much, how important it is to get the diabetes treated and addressed. Metabolic syndrome is pre-diabetes. It's where you're getting that midline weight. You're getting high sugar levels, high insulin levels. Um, your cholesterol and your blood pressure are getting affected. This is, this is you're about to become a diabetic. This is just as bad as diabetes. What about high cholesterol? Um, I don't really worry about total cholesterol. There's these things called bad cholesterol, which is your LDL, good cholesterol, which is your HDL. And we have goals for where we want those. And I've got the numbers up there. And then your triglycerides less than 100. So if we were to do a survey and ask what foods, what foods affect your bad cholesterol, your LDL? Most people are gonna tell you the fatty foods, red meat, saturated fats, butters, creams, fried foods, and cheese. That is true, but it misses a big portion of cholesterol. What foods affect your good cholesterol and your triglycerides or worsen your good cholesterol and raise your triglycerides, which are a bad type of fat? Those are the high sugary foods, the sweets, the carbs, the bread, the rice, the pasta, the potatoes. Those foods hurt your good cholesterol and raise your triglycerides. And a lot of people miss that. They only think of the fatty foods, not the carbs or the sugars. All right, what about high blood pressure? Your goal for everybody, this got updated in 2017. Everyone should have a, little, a blood pressure lower than 130 over 80 for everybody. The biggest problem is people don't check their blood pressure. I think everyone should be slapping a blood pressure cup on once or twice a week minimum. If you're on medication, it should probably be more than that. You should wake up in the morning, do whatever you do in your bathroom, brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, whatever. You go to your kitchen table, should be an arm cuff, not a wrist cuff. You check your blood pressure. Whatever you get, ignore it. Do not write it down. Wait three minutes, repeat it, and that's the blood pressure you write down. And I do not want you to check it when you're watching CNN or Fox News. I prefer you don't watch those anyways, but those raise blood pressure, trust me, okay? So I do caution over the age of 80 on the blood pressure goals. I tend to sometimes lax it a little bit because I, I do worry about the blood pressures going too low. I'm very careful about that because I don't want people to pass out and break a hip. Um, but so just, I am, I am savvy to that uh, when, uh, when, when you are a little older. So, when it comes to your diet, what ingredient and in food raises blood pressure? Salt, salt, and salt, all right? I hear, well, doctor, don't worry. I eat pink, pink Himalayan salt. Or doctor, I get salt from the Dead Sea. Or doctor, I get Salt Lake City salt. It, you know, it's all natural. What's the key word for all those things? Salt, okay? Salt is salt, no matter what kind. Some of those other salts have some minerals in it, trace minerals that can be healthy, but I never encourage that, especially if you struggle with high blood pressure, okay? Uh, my goals for salt is less than 1,500 milligrams a day. Now, that is very restrictive. 
Okay, salt, what I mean by salt is sodium. Sodium is salt. The national guidelines say either 1500 or 2400 for sodium milligrams. Okay, there is controversy. Everyone eats more salt than they think. And so I always start low because everybody overshoots, they really do. Um, the, um, uh, everybody also, when I'm talking to them, tell me, doctor, don't worry, I don't eat salt. I, I eat very low salt. What are they telling me usually? They're telling me they don't grab the salt shaker. So I'm gonna give you guys some examples. One teaspoon of table salt, flat table salt, has 2000 milligrams of sodium. A spoonful of soy sauce has 1000 milligrams of sodium. Let's, so, let's get the low sodium soy sauce, right? It's the green top bottle at the sushi restaurant. That is not low, that's 500 milligrams in a spoonful. That's relatively low. A cup, a low fat cottage cheese, 920 milligrams of sodium. Uh, an average bowl of soup, 1700 milligrams of sodium. Any lunch meat on average has about 1700 milligrams of sodium per three ounces. If you go to Chipotle and get some chicken or tofu with some salsa, some brown rice, a little bit of the cheese, that's about 2400 milligrams of sodium. Most salads at restaurants have well over a thousand milligrams of sodium. Panera, I looked at their site recently, they separate the dressing from the salad when you look at their nutrition. So they think, they know people are just gonna to go to the, the nutrition facts of the salad and think that that's got everything in it. The dressings are listed way at the bottom because they know that just adds and makes the numbers look worse. Um, these are some things I do. Um, very few supplements lower blood pressure. L-arginine and magnesium are, are somewhat effective. Uh, L-arginine is a uh, amino acid. Um, these are, um, you do, I really recommend you get these prescribed by somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, biofeedback is a special meditative technique that shows you how you're doing um, as you're, um, you're, you're meditating um, uh, and, and gives you the biological feedback is very effective. Exercise is great for lowering blood pressure. And then prescription medicines are often needed. This is the one area that really, I, I, it's hard to avoid medications. It's easier to lower cholesterol with supplements than it is blood pressure. And then finally, the last respect, your family history. You don't have to develop a disease just because it runs in your family. It simply means your chances are higher. My dad was the first diabetic in his family, in our family. But you don't have to have the family history to develop a disease, okay? So, so if you don't have the genes, you can get it. But if you have the genes, it doesn't mean you have you. It doesn't mean that you're going to get the disease. You can make a difference in your genes. What really determines health and disease for most of us? It's not the genetics or the biochemistry. It's actually the way we live our lives and the environment we live in. Almost all chronic disease is affected by this bigger more than what the genetics and the biochemistry do. The genetics kind of set us up but it's how we live our lives that really make that make or break us. The reality is that 300,000 Americans die each year from the combination of poor diet and inactivity. An integrative approach is critical for cardiac health because almost all cardiovascular disease is affected by the way you live your life. The modifiable lifestyle factors are nutrition, exercise, weight, stress mastery, smoking and alcohol use. All right. Lifestyle lesson number one. I've got like five minutes before 6.50 when I need to break for Q&A. So I'm gonna to have to go through these kind of fast. So we'll do the best we can. Okay, you are what you eat. Again, the food industry is out there to fool you because they wanna sell you a product. I believe that we should first start looking at how many calories we're taking in, okay? Now, we there was a big push for fat free back in um, the late 80s and early 90s. That's when the food pyramid got kind of updated in 1988, where they put the carbs all at the base of the pyramid. That's where the meaning that's where the majority of our diet should come from. And we fat free was healthy. And we are unfortunately still in that phase today. If something is fat free, it is healthy. 
And what has happened from 1988 to now is we've had this explosion of every single chronic disease. It has dramatically worsened, not just coronary disease, cancers, obesity, um, diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, you name it. They've all gotten worse since that moment. We have missed the boat. When I was in med medical school, I would, this was in the 90s, I thought I was being healthy when I had a bagel in the morning and I had a ruby red grapefruit juice, ocean spray. What I didn't realize, and I didn't have cream cheese because the cream cheese had fat in it. And so what I didn't realize was that bagel has five slices of bread in it. And, and it was just this giant load of, of sugar. A carbohydrate is a sugar. And the, the juice said 100 calories, but the serving said two and a half. So I was at having two and, a half, two and a half or 250 calories of sugar in my juice and then five slices of bread in my bagel. But I wasn't having cream cheese. You know, we missed the boat. The China Project, I won't review that, but this was a, is a great study. The, 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 um, there was a documentary on Netflix called Forks Over Knives, great documentary. There's another one called Game Changers that I like that talks a, little, a lot about these kind of things that really brought to light that nutrition is a big source for, for, for disease, okay? Um, now fat, here I am saying fat-free is not the way to go. There is unhealthy fats. Trans fats and saturated fats are unhealthy. Um, and I like to reduce those as much as possible. I'm not this big, you know, I mean, saturated fat, you know, that's a complicated story. Trans fats by far are bad. And those are the things usually in baked goods, um, these, especially these baked, baked goods that sit on the shelf for a long time. And I will say there's been a big push to get rid of trans fats and that's great. But again, they try to fool you because the serving size can affect how many trans fats are in there. And I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have time to go over that today. But if we can move our fats to more of the omega-3, the polyunsat polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated fats, these are fats in fish, avocados, olive oil, nuts, seeds. Those kind of fats are much healthier and I think can be embraced and incorporated into our diets. The glycemic index is a huge one that I try to... Um, to uh, get my patients to understand that there is this concept that the carbohydrate is a sugar. There are healthier carbs and there are evil carbs. So the, the carbs listed in the good column are ones that tend to not cause a spike in sugars, whereas the ones in the evil do. So for breads, bagels, baguettes, Middle Eastern flatbreads, English muffins, those are evil. The whole grain, whole wheat is much better. Although you still, this doesn't go over quantity. I wouldn't want more than a slice of bread in a day. For cereals, all brand fiber one are much better. Cheerios, which has a heart on the front of the box. Instant oatmeal, grape nuts, corn flakes. These things are promoted as, as being healthy. They are not, they are pure sugar. Uh, white rice, uh, pure sugar. Whole grain, buckwheat, bulgur, quinoa. Uh, brown rice, those are much better grains if you're going to do that, but it really shouldn't be more than a half a cup if you're going to do that. Fruit, uh, I cross off grapefruit because a lot of people take uh, medicines that interact with grapefruits. So I just, I don't encourage that, but um, there's a ton of crunchy fruit that are a lot better. Juice, pure sugar, watermelon, dates, raisins, pure sugar. The Hawaiian fruits are only okay. They're very soft and less fiber. Um, and this is where I point out for juice, I point out alcohol. And this is, this is the buzzkill for everybody. Um, a glass of wine is grape juice. A beer is wheat juice. There is no difference, guys. It is, it is huge in, ju in just calories. A lot of people don't realize this. A Bud Light has 110 calories. San Diego, we're known for our IPAs. So a lot of you know, everybody drinks beer, men and women, but I get a lot more men that, that preference beer and they come in with these huge guts and they're drinking two or three IPAs a night. An IPA on average has about 350 calories per 12 ounces. That's, that's my alarm for, it's time for the Q&A, but I got to finish a couple of these slides. So, so again, tons of pro, uh, good beans, legumes, lentils are great for protein, higher glycemic or, or lower glycemic. Pasta is evil. 
Um, it is a huge, uh, the problem with pasta, even if you do the good pasta, which is whole wheat, is we have a problem with quantity. They don't do that in Italy. Italy, it's a small little pasta prima, like an appetizer. And the meal is a meat and veggies. Um, here in the US, we made the pasta our dinner. It's like this huge plate of noodles and then we go get seconds. It's, it's literally more carbs than you should be eating for a week in a typical average US plate of pasta. Um, tons of good veggies, potatoes tend to be the bad ones. The Mediterranean diet is a reasonable diet. That's basically fish so, uh, as a main source of meats, um, uh, whole grains, uh, olive oil as your main source of fat, added fat, uh, and then tons of veggies and healthier fruits, nuts, seeds, avocados also. Mediterranean diet is a reasonable approach. Lots of good research. I do not have time to go over this slide, but again, food can be a source of medicine for you. It really can. Um, okay, lifestyle lesson number two, no diet is healthy without exercise. Um, here the doctor's asking his patient, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Uh, I, I always, I find that very powerful. Um, tons of research proving that a sedentary lifestyle results in premature death. Um, and a number one I exercise, one number one excuse I get for not exercising is not enough time. But I always point out that the average American watches about 30 hours of television a week. You know what I'm talking about. Um, this is a real place in San Diego and Point Loma. Um, this summarizes where we are with fitness in our country. Uh, my prescription is we should be exercising seven days a week. Um, cardio should always be first, at least 30 minutes, seven days a week. I love resistance training, which is the weightlifting, the core strength, the bands, but that should be in addition, in addition to the cardio. I don't usually recommend heart rate goals. I typically recommend perceived exertion which is if you, 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 know, you, you feel like you're working out, if it feels like a good workout, you're a little sweaty, a little out of breath, that's a good workout. I don't like giving heart rate goals because it kind of takes the fun away. I can give them and there's an equation for it, but again, I think it kind of takes the, the fun away. Plus there's medicines that people take that suppress the heart rate and it's kind of unfair. Lifestyle lesson number three, don't estimate, underestimate the importance and the power of good rest at night. Um, there's a lot of things we can do to work on sleep hygiene and really embrace a better night's sleep. There are supplements that can be incorporated um, that, that really can be additive. But again, the prescription meds for sleep, the supplements, they all suck. They really do. Um, so, so really going into the hygiene is a big component to this. Um, lifestyle lesson four, and I, I, this is my last one and then I'll break. I, I feel bad that I'm rushing through some of this. I'd love to come, come back, do an in-person visit with you guys and give you guys a lot more details. But we are under, I mean, I literally unprecedented levels of stress in our, in, our, in our lives, unprecedented. I won't even review what they are because we all know them. We've lived them for this past year. Um, the reality is that the mental and emotional aspects of healing cannot be separated from the physical. We have been prepared to fight or flight. That we were, back when we were cavemen and women, we had to hunt for our food. We had to survive. We had to run from the woolly mammoths and the saber tooth tigers. You know, we had to live to pass on our genes. But we don't have to do that anymore. We're not cavemen and women. My wife probably would disagree with me about that. But anyways, um, the, uh, that was a joke. So um, the, um, you know, we, our stressors are interacting, meeting deadlines, driving in traffic, paying bills, making decisions, wearing masks, trying not to get COVID, yada, yada, yada. Those are real stressors that get interpreted as a threat to the body, get stimulated the same way any stress does. We get discharge of our sympathetic system and we get release of stress hormones. These go into the bloodstream they raise our blood sugar, they raise our blood pressure, they raise our cholesterol. The stress response is real and it hurts us. Um, large study looking at this with international study on 52,000 patients. And what they found was these stressors contribute to all cause disease. And those cardiovascular risk factors we talk about, 
they actually worsen those. When you're stressed, you smoke more, you eat more. When you're angry, your blood pressure goes up. These things really hurt our, our uh, when you're depressed, you eat more. These hurt our outcomes, our health. Um, you know, it's funny, my mom, um, when my dad was really sick with diabetes, my mom went to the doctor and they, she came home all upset because the doctor had the gall to suggest my dad was depressed. My, my, that doctor was right. My dad was taking 19 different pills. He was slowly diabe dying from his diabetes. That doctor was right. But why was my mom upset? My mom was of this generation where depression was looked at as a weakness. Stress anxiety was looked at as a weakness. It is not. This is a real issue, real biochemical changes that go on the brain. If we can understand that and talk to, talk to a psychologist, get the right help, learn some of these techniques and, and learn how to cope with our stress better, it's crazy how more, much more effective and healthy we can become. Um, some of the warning signs are loss of focus and mental clarity, lack of ability to relax and sleep, loss of self-esteem, feeling tired, on edge, angry. I uh, hear that one guy saw his buddy, my doctor told me to avoid any unnecessary stress so I didn't open his bill. Um, I, I like that. Anyway, so uh, lots of things that can be done that I don't have time to go over. Meditation works. I thought I could meditate. Holy cow. I, I would sit there trying to meditate. I'd be thinking about dinner. I'd be thinking about what I had to do the next day. It was hard. So I had to learn formally how to meditate. We teach meditation at our center. I know you have opportunities to learn different forms of meditation, um, transcendental meditation, mindfulness meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, all these things work. That breathing exercise that I went over with you, it takes 19 seconds. I wake up in the morning, I do it four times on the edge of my bed. 19 times four is a minute and a half. When I go to bed at night, I do it four times. I lay down and do it, it helps me fall asleep. During a meeting, if I'm stressed out because I'm not getting something I want for my patients, the system doesn't want to pay for something or whatever, I'll stop and I'll breathe, calm myself down and I'll try a different approach. I have my eyes open, people don't realize what I'm doing but I'm meditating right in front of them. It works. Um, support can go a long way if you have people in your lives you can lean on. There's tons of different things where you, that you can incorporate where you could turn strength in, or stress into strength. I'll leave you with this quote by Charles Darwin before we get to Q and A if I, if I left any time for that. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but it's the one most responsive to change. And here the husband, the, the guy is telling his wife, hey, is this great traffic or what? Anyways, I, I wanna thank you guys for paying attention. Um, hopefully I didn't lose anybody. Um, I know I went fast, there was a lot to cover. I'm happy to hang out for as long as you guys want for Q and A, um, but again, thank you for paying attention. I, I love spreading the word of what I do. Uh, and and I, I, I appreciate that Torrance Memorial is really embracing this. I, I really feel their efforts to really uh, open, be open to these approaches. Um, there is, it's changing times and man, it is a good time because we're, be we're getting integrative medicine spread throughout the country. Torrance has been great. I'm proud of scripts and what we've been able to accomplish. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suhar wonderful lecture. I'm Dr. Nicole Alexander Spencer. I'm the chair of integrative medicine here at Torrance Memorial. And we're so happy that you gave this presentation on integrative cardi cardiology. It's so timely. It's wonderful. And, um, and we have some questions for you. Okay. Um, and Torrance Memorial is, you know, embracing integrative medicine. Mm -hmm. And every year we go to the Scripps con conference as well. So cool. actually last time we were there, we met you. So it's good to see you again. Um, so some of the questions I have are, uh, one is, do you, um, how do you lower your heart score? Somebody said they had a heart score of 412, a calcium heart score. Yeah, so that uh, that question. So there's a, I, I that's a tool that I use all the time in my world. Um, you know, um, it's called a CT coronary calcium score. That's wh whoever asked the question is referencing that, and it's a CAT scan that's non-contrast. It looks at the heart and tells me if you're developing cal calcified plaque. 
high, I get a lot of people, a lot of patients that come to me with high cholesterol. Yeah. Uh oh, you're you know, frozen. So I like to take a look under the hood. So this CAT scan, very low radiation. Um, this CAT scan, um, and again, no dye, um, will show me if you're developing calcified plaque and it'll give me a score. So that's the number, it's supposed to be zero. When, it, when we get the number back, it ranges between one and a thousand. The American College of Cardiology recognizes 300, over 300 is actually considered severe. And so as far as the amount of plaque, um, but I don't get, I don't, I don't, I encourage my patients to not get distressed over having a score like that. Whoever shared that they have, knowing that you have it, now you could do something about it. You know, now it's motivation to say, maybe we can get our diet better. Maybe we can get our exercise better. Maybe we could get um, our cholesterol better. You know, maybe you need a statin. Maybe you need a supplement. You know, whatever we can to get your risk better. I would argue, yes, it's pot. You're asking, can I get that number lower? You're asking about reversal. That's the holy grail when it comes to coronary atherosclerosis. I want to believe it's possible. The problem with reversal for another time, we're trying to get stiffer and we tend to get plaque. It's a natural process. So getting reversal, I believe is hard to accomplish. I don't think it's impossible. There's only been one study that I've ever seen that has even documented some evidence of that. It was a study out of the Cleveland Clinic um, where they took, they did ultrasound inside coronary arteries. And after using a high dose statin, they, were, they saw that the plaque regressed over two years. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, if we could get the cholesterol really suppressed, we could get people going more towards a vegan diet. We can get patients exercising daily robustly. I want to believe it's possible. Um, what my main goal for my patients is to stabilize it and keep it from becoming ruptured or, or increased like heart attack risk. So I think that would be more reasonable goal instead of going for this very difficult reversal. Anyways, that's a long answer for a question, but uh, hopefully that answered it. Thank you. So I find that for my patients, when I order a CT angio for the calcium score, a lot of times it's not covered. So that's a little frustrating, but I do like to use this tool as um, for my grave patient areas, the ones that are don't want to take statins. Um, I'm also integrative medicine, family medicine at Torrance Memorial. Somebody had asked if Torrance Memorial has an integrative practitioner and I, my panel's open and you're able to make an appointment with me. So if you have any further, you know, treatments or questions, then I'm available for that. Somebody asked, uh, Dr. Suhar, if you're seeing patients outside of Scripps or do you only see patients at Scripps? So, um, so a couple things, first of all, um, a comment about the cost of that last scan. Um, Scripps, it, it, the cost point is set up by these systems. So Scripps, for example, wanted to make our scan $800 and I about croaked. I spent about six months lobbying to our administration and we brought it down to $200 um, successfully. And every year I have to lobby for it again because there's some, there's some administrator that wants to raise the price again. And, it, and $800 is cost prohibitive. 200 tends to be a lot better and a little more acceptable by my patients. I don't know what, what you guys have at Torrance, but um, you can find a place, I, most places will do it between 100 and 200 for that scan. And, and unfortunately, insurances don't believe in, in prevention as much and it's considered a preventative therapy. So, uh, or, or tool, not, not therapy, a tool. So, and the other thing is I love the fact that you guys have, that Torrance Memorial has family medicine integrative approaches. We actually lack that at Scripps. We do not have uh, primary care integrated medicine. It kills me. I have to refer all mine outside. The answer to your question is yes. I see patients outside of um, Scripps all the time. I get tons of patients, um, but um, I also would embrace your local system if there's good, you know, integrative uh, uh, physicians in your own system. Usually, it's an easier approach. When we're dealing with cardiology, I do like to have people locally. You know, but again, if you came down for a consult to see if you're on the right approach, I'm happy to see you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and then another question is, there's a lot of plant-based diet um, vegans that, can you make a comment on the vegan diet? How, um, what's your opinion on it? Um, so, so I believe the vegan diet works. First and foremost, if, if you go vegan, um, you need to make sure you, you supplement with vitamin B12. That's critical, okay? Most people understand that nowadays. Um, I think the vegan diet has been shown uh, through that work through the China study uh, and some of the work of uh, Dr. Campbell and Dr. Esselstein are some of my heroes um, who have done a, a ton of, they've laid a lot of groundwork. Um, uh, somebody's asking about my video, hold on a second. The video will be available. It's recorded. Can you guys still see me? You're frozen. That's weird. Is that any better? My information in the chat. Okay, a thumbs up if you guys can see me, anybody? You're no. frozen. Okay, well, I'm frozen. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, you really, you really don't need to see me. Hopefully it's frozen on a good look. But anyways, um, uh, I don't know why it's frozen, but anyways. Um, let me see. Try to shut down some things here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, I don't know. Anyways, um, uh, what was the last question again? Vegan diet, can you comment oh, yeah. on it? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot of evidence showing that the vegan diet actually is a better way to accomplish that goal of reversal for heart disease. I think it helps a lot of different areas of chronic disease, not just heart disease. Um, it, I, am I personally vegan? I'm about, I'm mostly vegan, about 80%. I don't know if you could say that most. I have four kids and I'm raising them with a very broad palate. Um, they, um, I like exposing them to a lot of different things. We do fish, we do chicken, um, but we also, we're about vegan about four days a week simply because we really do enjoy a lot of different vegan meals. There's a ton of great recipes out there. Um, I have an air fryer. We love doing using that. It's a great way to crisp without using uh, oil. Um, so uh, anyway, so I think there's, there's really good science and evidence proving that the vegan diet is very helpful. Um, nutrition, Torrance Memorial has an outpatient medical nutrition therapy program for people who want assistance in following a vegan or plant forward diet. Um, that was from our uh, nutritionist, Joanna, who's on the integrative medicine um, committee with me. My, um, in the chat, somebody was asking, we're going to put my information in the chat. So if you want to make an appointment, um, it's Dr. Nicole Alexander Spencer, just say you want to make an integrative medicine appointment. Um, and then for the tobacco, um, somebody had mentioned that for quitting, you said cool turkey. Somebody said, well, butin worked better than Chantix. I just wanted to make that comment. Can you comment on lipoprotein A? Sure. So lipoprotein A is a genetic, it's a cholesterol protein that tends to be genetically, we find that it runs genetically in, in individuals. So like if I have somebody with an ele elevated L lipoprotein A level, it'll be um, kind of in their family. So others in the family will have that. The lipoprotein A molecule or cholesterol molecule increases risk for heart disease. Does it, if you have an elevated lipoprotein A, it doesn't mean you're gonna get heart disease, but it definitely increases that risk. It's been comparable, it's been compared to an elevated risk equal to, um, can you guys still hear me? There's something going on with the system. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so uh, the elevated lipoprotein A um, has been comparable, comparable to increased risk of high blood pressure, increased risk of what high cholesterol does. It increases your risk. The way I think about it is it makes your LDL cholesterol stickier. That's kind of like the elementary way of understanding it. So I try to either lower your lipoprotein A or I try to lower your LDL significantly, okay? Because if it makes your LDL stickier, if you have less LDL, then you're gonna have less LDL to be stickier. Um, but I also try to lower the LPA, but that is profoundly difficult. There's only two things that have been, well, two therapies that have been shown. Exercise and nutrition can lower it. And for nutrition, it's usually less carbs. Um, 
But again, you could be the best diet, best exercise, and your LPA may not, not improve. Um, niacin or nicotinic acid can lower LPA, but again, needs to be prescribed by a professional that monitors your liver. And then the other thing is um, uh, the um, uh, is a newer therapy, which is a prescription called a PCSK9 inhibitor. That has been shown to be that's a prescription. Um, that's for cholesterol. It's been shown to be very effective for lowering uh, LP, LP, well, pretty effective for lowering LPA. Okay. Someone wanted you to make a comment on is eating a hundred percent whole wheat bread. Um, okay. Um, so that is way better than white bread. So that is considered a lower glycemic index diet. Um, if anybody saw a panda for a second, I don't know if you saw that. My, that was my daughter, by the way, she's a big panda fan. And the, my four kids had to do on school learning and they changed my zoom all the time. But anyways, um, so, um, uh, uh, whole wheat bread, hundred percent whole wheat is a better type of bread. It is a lower glycemic index. It's got basically got more fiber in it. So yes, it's better. Okay. Um, you said, you know, limit also during, you know, Mediterranean diet is best limit to maybe one piece of bread a day. Um, so that's just something that, you um, know, I you know, there, there's different, I agree with. there's different diet approaches. I, I, I mentioned the Mediterranean diet because it has the, that diet has the most research out there. It really Absolutely. does. And, and I don't like the word diet because diet is something you can stop. Um, but Mediterranean diet is really not a diet. It's really a way of eating, a style of eating. And I have found that um, the Mediterranean diet seems to be embraced by most individuals. It's something people can embrace and actually enjoy. You, know, you do other diets like the ketogenic diet or the v, you know, go vegan and stuff. Those are things that, I, that a lot of my patients have, have been found a little more difficult to embrace. So uh, anyway, so that's why I mentioned the Mediterranean diet. That's not the only approach, but it actually is the diet with the most proven research. You're, we we're talking about diet. Can you talk about the paleo keto diets? What's your opinion on those? Um, you know, I think they're, the research is lacking. Um, there is some research. I, you know, I don't, I'm not a big, as big of a fan of the paleo. I'm more of a fan of keto, but it needs to be modified. I'm not a fan of the high fat approach. Um, like like the, the, just any fat, like bacon, for example. I'm more of the fan of the modified approach where um, it, it, it's a lot more uh, healthier fats like fish, some chicken would be okay, um, nuts, seeds, avocados, um, so. Okay, and then people are juicing, not orange juice, but green juice. Can you comment on that? How do you feel about? I don't know if you can see my video, but I'm stabbing myself. Um, <laughs> I am not a fan of juicing. Um, I'm a fan of, of blending. There's a big difference there. Um, juicing takes all the fiber. If you, even if you're doing green juice, you're taking all the fiber out. I, um, I, I, um, I, I, I drink a smoothie every single morning. It consists of kale, spinach, cucumber, carrot. Um, it's got two lemon wedges, one apple, and it has um, um, some... Um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on some of the other things in it uh, and a beet. It has a raw beet in it. And I use a Vitamix and I blend it um, I, with water. I only put water in it. Um, and I, I drink that, what I just said, over about four days. Um, I have a container that I suck the air out. So I blend it once, I put it in there. And then every morning I get my ladle, I stir it. I make my 16 ounce glass and then I seal it back up, take the air out. And I do that every day for four days. And then the next day I make another one. Um, so so, but that's blending because you keep all the fiber. Juicing, I'm not as big of a fan because you're taking the best part away, which is the fiber. Okay, so avoid juicing. Blending smoothies are good. Yeah, that's, um, my, that's my approach, yeah. Yeah. Um, how many eggs should someone eat a day if they have high cholesterol? Um, there's controversy over that. Uh, you know, for years, I was always taught avoid eggs when you have high cholesterol. I think the egg, so what we're talking about is the yolk. Nobody argues about the egg white. The egg white is a great source of protein. 
Um, the yolk, I think, actually has a, a, a fair amount of very healthy omega-3s. There's also really good amino acids in yolk that should not be discouraged. Um, you know, I, I'm okay with, you know, you know, some eggs in the week, but I encourage it not to be your only breakfast. You know, I don't necessarily give it a number, but when I'm talking to somebody about nutrition, I start laying the groundwork. We have a nutritionist at our center. Um, I, I, we try to, I go up, I go over different sources for breakfast, you know, whether that's a Greek, a, a fat, you know, a low fat or fat free Greek yogurt, um, and then some nuts and seeds in that, and, and maybe some healthy fruit like berries. Um, that could be a breakfast. You could do a little um, egg scramble with um, some, some sauteed onion and spinach. That's a good breakfast. You know, try to mix it up and not make it too many eggs in the week. Um, but I, I, wouldn't I don't avoid every yolk. So what's the number? Uh, I don't know, two to four um, a week. Two to four with the yolk. Yeah, with the yolk, and then you can embrace some egg whites. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not as stuck on the number. I just like variety and, and kind of mixing it up. Okay. Um, is treating blood pressure and cholesterol, lowering cholesterol, a risk for dementia? Is, so that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. You know, at our natural supplements conference, that, that came up with some of the greatest minds. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Bredesen out of UCLA. I think his, uh, he's the, one of the few uh, physicians that's, he's a neurologist out of UCLA, and he's one of the few physicians that's really taking a more natural, integrative approach to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, uh, he was there at the last conference we had in person, which was in 2019, I think or 2020, I can't remember when our last one was. But somebody raised that question, you know, there's this, this thought of your brain is mostly cholesterol. Um, you know, and, and so if we lower cholesterol, are we going to hurt our brain and cause dementia? It, back in 2012, the FDA brought out a warning about cholesterol and uh, um, saying that, you know, cholesterol statins could potentiate or cause cognitive, cognitive issues. Um, that has never been proven. They've actually done a ton of research studies specifically trying to address that question. And it has never been proven. There's been research on, can you put the round peg in the round hole? Can you, can you do memory recall? You know, really trying to test this. Um, and lowering cholesterol very aggressively I, I mean, I get patients with LDL cholesterol is below 10. I don't necessarily keep them there, but I've not had any patients really worsen their cognitive issues on that. You know, there's patients where I have had, you know, quadruple bypass, and they've had a second bypass, they've been stented, I mean, just horrible vascular problems. And we really try to suppress their cholesterol and they're not having dementia problems. In fact, I argue there's a lot of dementia that gets blamed on, on Alzheimer's and it probably should be blamed on vascular disease. So I worry that we're under treating our risk factors for, for vascular disease on some dementia. You know, so, so be careful when you start to really question the dementia thing. Um, you know, I find cognitive issues are big time affected by stress and poor sleep. But yet somebody puts on, gets put on a cholesterol lowering therapy and they instantly blame that. So think about it. it. It's really a whole body approach. It's not just lowering your cholesterol. Lowering blood pressure, if it goes low, yeah. I mean, if you get hypotensive where your blood pressure is below 100, that could affect your mentation. Does that lead to dementia? Probably not. I don't really know any research linking that. Could it make you delirious and not perform good if you have low blood pressure? Yeah. So, so I don't think medicines the lower blood pressure specifically result in dementia as far as anything I know, um, but it could contribute to you not mentally performing well if your blood pressure goes very low. But I'm saying under 100, you know, very low at 110, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily blame that on cognitive or you know, result, say that would result in that. You, 
we're going to start wrapping it up. I just have a couple more questions, comments. Sure. Torrance Memorial has an exercise program that starts May 8th. It's an eight-week program involving yoga, tai chi, and you can find that at torrancememorial.org um, slash classes. Um, can you make a comment on coenzyme Q10? Sure. Um, coenzyme Q10 is found primarily in muscle cells. It's actually in the mitochondria of the muscle cells. And again, you got muscle all over. Your heart has muscle, you got muscle all over the skeleton, you got muscles in your internal organs, muscles everywhere. Um, the, um, uh, there's a belief, the reason this comes up is when people have muscle disorders, muscle issues, or specifically when they take a statin to lower their cholesterol, um, there's this, this issue with coenzyme Q10 levels lowering. Um, that's been proven. Statins clearly have been proven to lower coenzyme Q10. What we know is that when you take coenzyme Q10 as a supplement, your coenzyme Q10 levels in your blood go back up. That's been proven also. What's unfortunately never been proven in robust research is that it makes a difference. You know, um, they, 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 there's been these small studies on like 10 patients or whatever. I get people that quote these really, really poorly performed studies. I usually recommend coenzyme Q10 to my patients with statins. That's purely based anecdotally, based on my patients tend to complain less about less muscle issues when I put them on coenzyme Q10 when I do it, when I give them a statin. So I like it, it's water soluble. I think there's no risk of being on it. Um, I typically, you know, typically recommend anywhere between 100 to 300 milligrams of coenzyme Q10. Ubiquinol is the other four, like it's the, ubiquinol and coenzyme, coenzyme Q10 are the same thing. Um, ubiquinol, I, I, I like to recommend that because it's an, more of the active form. So, um, but there you go. Okay, and you mentioned magnesium, so um, magnesium is my number one supplement prescribed. I freaking love magnesium. How much? Um, I'm sorry? How much magnesium? Yeah, so, so first of all, it's not how much, it's what type. What type? Yeah, so, so I, I'll ask, the, if it, you know, I don't know, I'm not to put you on the spot as a physician, but if you go in the hospital and um, I'm gonna ask you if you, if you realize what most physicians prescribe for their, their, their magnesium. Do you know, do you know what the prescribed magnesium, citrate. which one? <laughs> magnesium citrate. It's actually oxide. Oh. And the reason is, is that that's the only one that's prescription. See, physicians don't like most, I'm, I'm generalizing. Okay. But a lot of physicians don't like to, to give something that's without a prescription. And so you could go to a pharmacy with a prescription for magnesium oxide, and that one is, um, is uh, accepted at the pharmacist, at the counter. It's not over the counter. The problem with magnesium oxide is only 10% of magnesium oxide is absorbed. Magnesium citrate is about 40 to 50% absorbed. Magnesium glycinate is about... 50 to 60 percent absorbed. And that's my favorite form. Magnesium L-theanate, there's this concept that that crosses the, the blood-brain barrier better and you get more cerebral effects, benefits from the magnesium. Um, and it's probably in the 40 to 50 percent absorption rate. Um, I, have to, I have to look that up. I haven't looked that one up in a while. But I, my favorite one is magnesium glycinate. Um, the only side effect of magnesium is diarrhea. Um, so, so that's the limitation on the, the, the question of how much. So, so I typically like to recommend around 200 to 300 milligrams, somewhere in that range, once or twice a day, if somebody can tolerate that, as long as it doesn't cause diarrhea. Now, the benefits of magnesium, it lowers blood pressure, decreases arrhythmias, decreases palpitations, decreases constipation, it treats constipation, it strengthens bones, and it, it helps with sleep, and it lowers anxiety. I mean, come on, look, listen to all those benefits from magnesium. That's incredible. 
So calm, have you heard of calm? Do you like yeah. that magnesium? Yeah, so that's magnesium citrate. And again, it's, it's a good, so the benefit of calm that I like is it's a powder. And so you can dose it. So if people struggle with how much that comes powder for them and you can kind of take a little bit, take a little bit more and see if it causes diarrhea. Um, uh, so again, glycinate is my best form, but it doesn't come in powder form. It, it comes usually as a, cat, a pill. Um, you know, the powder is something if you struggle with, with, if you struggle with pills or you like to dose it a little bit, I think calm is a very good approach. Uh, again, that's magnesium citrate. Um, two more questions. The garlic, your comp, uh, comments on garlic with reducing blood pressure and is coffee okay? Ah, oh, the great coffee question. So, so garlic, um, I use, uh, I actually, again, I'm not, I don't sell anything. The one brand of garlic that has been really shown in the research to be the effective is kyolic, okay? Kyolic aged garlic. Um, I'm not recommending that for any reason other than that has been where the research is. That was Dr. Budoff out of UCI where he did a lot of the research showing that garlic can, can help um, with um, slow down coronary calcification that we see on that one CAT scan we talked about. And so that's the, the um, that I do think garlic, I love garlic for my patients with coronary disease or coronary atherosclerosis. Um, uh, you gotta be careful because garlic can thin your blood. So a lot of my patients with coronary disease take aspirin, they take a baby aspirin or, or fish oil or, and or fish oil, which also thins the blood. Garlic thins the blood. So a lot of these things can thin the blood. Um, but I do like garlic just to answer that question. I think it has a, a purpose. Um, I personally eat a ton of garlic. I find that also is a useful approach if you want to go dietary. Um, the benefit of the, the capsule is it's a lot more concentrated. It's a stronger form of garlic and you're going to get a lot more of the active ingredient if you take the capsule. Any, a lot more than what you would get dietary from a dietary approach. Um, the uh, coffee question. So You'll, if you ask most of my patients, they're going to say, Dr. Suhar thinks coffee is the drink of the devil. Um, I do not like coffee. I think coffee is a drug. It's acidic. And I think it is not beneficial. That is my feelings. And, and that's what I believe. That being said, 80% of US adults drink coffee. My own wife, I make it for her every morning. Because, you know, happy wife, happy life, right? Uh, my wife loves coffee and she drinks a small cup. It's about six ounces every morning. I brew her a, cu a cup and, and she, she it keeps, starts her day off. So what I encourage with my patients is to understand that, that moderation is a big key to everything I'm talking about. You know, if you, if you really want to know what I think about nutrition is if something tastes good, spit it out because it's probably not good for you. Um, you know, but that's not the right approach to take with my patients because we got to find that balance and that moderation. So what I don't want, what I don't want is my patients drinking three, four cups of coffee a day. You know, it's like, Hey, can we, can, can we do one cup, you know, maybe switch over to some green tea, which has much better effect on cholesterol, a lot more antioxidants and far much less caffeine. Um, you can also decaffeinate your green tea yourself if you wanted to. Um, and not lose the antioxidants. Um, but uh, coffee is addictive and it's a drug. Beware of the brew houses. Starbucks, uh, 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 Coffee Bean, um, uh, these places have three to four times the amount of caffeine than a regular cup of homebrewed coffee. The business model for Starbucks, I'm not just picking on Starbucks, it's all of them even the ones that have those creative names that are the little mom and pop one down the street. Their business model is they do not want you waking up in the morning saying, I need a cup of coffee. They do not want that. They want you waking up in the morning saying, I need Starbucks. There is a big difference, okay? So be aware of that. And uh, those places are evil, in my opinion, as far as the addiction for coffee. I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but that question was asked and that's what I believe. I know you said red wine is like juice, but, or wine, but red wine has 
resveratrol and antioxidant. And Dr. Andrew Wild says, well, you know, if you have a, a glass of red wine at night, what do you, what are your comments on that? So Dr. Andrew Wild is one of my heroes. Um, I love him. Um, I did his fellowship uh, that he created through the University of Arizona. That's where I did my integrated. So did I. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you did too, uh, which is incredible. And I hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. It was wonderful. My staff, my staff is right behind me. Um, but um, I don't know if I'm still frozen, but maybe I am. But anyways, um, the um, uh, you're right. Red wine does have antioxidants in it. It has resveratrol in it. I would much rather patients um, take resveratrol as a supplement. Uh, that's my opinion. I think red wine is a source of calories and sugar. I think red wine, and it's not just wine, all alcohol. I think all alcohol has those antioxidants and benefits. Okay, I really do. And, and can re raise some good cholesterol touch. It's not just red wine, but the effect of uh, the sugar, the effect on your weight, the effect on your decreased metabolism, and the real effect that alcohol has on sleep, quality of sleep, is too much. Mm. And that's why I really encourage far less alcohol. I do not like it as a nightly habit. It, you know, alcohol is fun. And I admit, I like that. I don't actually like wine myself. My wife does. Um, I like, um, you know, I, I like beer. Um, but I found a very low calorie IPA, which is only hundred calories. And I tend to drink that on a Friday night with my wife. We like to have a glass, you know, that's it. So I don't avoid every, again, it's that moderation. I don't personally avoid every glass of alcohol. If I get together with some buddies, you know, I'd like to have a glass of beer with them, you know, but, um, I, I try not to make it more than that, you know? Um, so anyways, that's my approach to alcohol. Okay, we're winding down. They're telling me it's 7.30, but can you comment on omega-3s and red yeast rice? Because sometimes my patients won't take statins. They prefer red yeast rice. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm a huge fan of omega-3s. You have to be careful about the source. Um, you know, there's a lot of omega-3s that are spoiled at, at, when they sit on the counter, over the counter. Um, I do think the EPA only approach to omega threes. I really like that approach for cardiovascular disease. There's some research really suggesting that that is a, a really good way to go. Um, I do think the prescription EPA called Vesepa is a very very good product. Um, so uh, excuse me. So I, I I do. I'm a huge fan of omega threes. Uh, red yeast rice. I also use a ton in my practice. Um, red yeast rice is basically, I think about it as a very a natural statin. It works just like a statin. Um, when I um, counsel my patients, I say, listen, you can have the same side effects on red yeast rice as you can with a statin. I'm very open and I'm very honest about that. That being said, I've had patients that have had side effects on statins and I've switched them over to red yeast rice and they don't have side effects. I think red yeast rice is less potent and it doesn't have a lot of the additives. And so um, I, I typically, I am also super anal about my brand with red yeast rice. Um, is that okay if I share that? Again, yes. uh, yeah, I don't, I don't make anything out of this. I'm very important. I keep on saying that. I really don't, I, honest to God. Um, I, um, I like the brand designs for health. It's organic. It's made in the US. I have seen people that I put on designs for health red yeast rice, their cholesterol has improved. And then they switch over to a Costco brand just to save some money. That's an expensive brand, but they save money and their cholesterol worsens. I see it all the time. So I am very anal retentive about my brand when it comes to red yeast rice, more so than any other supplement. I actually, that's the only brand I prescribe for red yeast rice. Okay, thank you, Dr. Suhar uh, with Scripps so much. This has been a great uh, lecture and presentation, it will be recorded. So for anyone that missed it, thank you all for participating, your attention on this, uh, what day is it, Tuesday night? And if you need to see an integrative uh, doctor, then look me up, Dr. Nicole Alexander Spencer. Take care, good night.